Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Woodburn Accountants and Advisors webinar series on choosing a location in China. Are you familiar with the new foreign investment law in China? Do you know how it might impact you as an investor in the market? Are you updated on China's negative list as well as the encouraged industries list? Have you chosen a location in China for registering your company? Are you aware of the various zones and benefits that they offer? Are you familiar with the variety of pros and cons between different commercial spaces? Do you know what the legal and tax consequences are of choosing the right location? If you want to move cities, do you know how it works? Woodburn Accountants and Advisors is offering this series of complimentary webinars on this subject. And together with Caroline Della Sega from Knight Frank, we will provide you with information and tools to enrich your China business skills and enhance your market entry and expansion efforts. Today, we will be looking at the legal and tax consequences for selecting an office in China. Again, just to go through a few admin slides for those of you that haven't joined previous webinars. When you join the GoToWebinar system, you will be led to an option uh, within the audio section of your control panel of either using your computer audio or a landline. Generally speaking, landlines are more sure and give better sound system than if you use your computer audio. If you are in locations um, that are a little bit restricted, like China and the Middle East, you may find it more useful to utilize a VPN to get connected to the GoToWebinar system and have more stability online. If you decide to utilize a landline throughout this presentation, then you just click in the audio section, you switch from mic and speakers to telephone, you will have a dial-in number, access code, and audio pin. Unfortunately, the GoToWebinar system does not have dial-in numbers for Asia yet. They only have it for the US, Canada, and mainland Europe. As is very typical with our webinar series, we do aim for a five to 10 minute Q&A session. Unfortunately, Caroline could not attend today's session, so there, she won't be the moderator. I will be the moderator. Um, so if there are any questions that do pop in, um, I will aim to answer them. If they are very specific to your own situation, I will probably leave them out of today's Q&A and answer you then directly and separately. Um, it would be wonderful if you could just help to click on the raise your hand button in your control panel, because that will allow me to know that some of you are able to listen in. Thank you very much. You can re-click that button and the hand will then disappear from your own control panel. So again, I'm seeing a lot of new names. So just very briefly, who we are. Woodburn Accountants and Advisors is specialized in inbound investment to China and Hong Kong. Uh, what we do is we establish, manage, and administer companies in both jurisdictions based on our clients' goals and objectives within the markets. Um, our services range throughout a client's China journey. Everything from discussing trade flows, um, service flows, invoicing, all the way to market entry requirements, pre-investment strategy, cross-border investment, tax optimization, corporate restructuring. And of course, we do the mundane functions that most companies don't like to do. Um, which is all the administration and compliance functions that entities have to do in both jurisdictions. Um, all of our clients are international organizations going into the market and they all focus on different objectives within China and within Asia. So it could be that they are manufacturing themselves, they're outsourcing the manufacturing to third parties, it could be that they are exporting to China, exporting from China, or they're offering a range of services within the Chinese market. Um, they could also be doing a multiple of those functions within their own organization. Um, as I usually do with most of my presentations, I always have a, a little bit of a disclaimer. There is a wide variety of people online today uh, from different industries and different sec uh, sectors. So the presentation for today are tips on what you need to 
think about from a legal and tax perspective when choosing your location. Some of those items might not apply to you depending on what your goal and objective is in doing, doing in China. So just keep that in mind. There may be things that are very useful to you. There may be things that might not be so useful, um, but it's just a way to get all of the information out there uh, for the public. Um, to put a voice, uh, to put a face to the voice, uh, my name is Christina kohler Kaluccia. I'm the head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. I've been in the corporate services sector in China since 2003 when I first landed uh, in Shanghai. Um, and I've been working solely on the Chinese market for the past 16 years. My expertise is on inbound investment into China. Um, as we are a family business, my brother's expertise is actually on inbound investment into Hong Kong. Uh, so we share that responsibility a little bit. I've seen a lot of things happen on the, on the Chinese market over the last 16 years. Um, it's been a great pleasure helping companies uh, go into the market, expand within the market, go through mergers and acquisitions, um, as well as exit from the market just because they've seen um, that it isn't right now a potential for them. So I've seen a little bit of everything happen. Now today's topic is about the legal and tax consequences of selecting your location in China. And choosing a location for a new business, especially in such a large territory as China, is one of the most important decisions entrepreneurs make during their planning phase of launching their business. Um, I meet with clients or I'm, I'm talking with clients right now who, you know, they see potential in three or four variety, in three or four cities because they may have suppliers in one location, they may have customers in another location, the type of employees they need will be in a third location. So they struggle a lot in finding the right location and China unfortunately does not make it so easy for you to have multiple locations running. Um, it is quite costly. So, you know, there are a lot of things that you need to take into consideration, which I will be going through when trying to find your location. So the agenda for today is obviously looking at 10 key consideration points, looking again at the free trade zones for those of you that missed Monday's session. You know, what are the manufacturing cities? If that is something that you're looking to do, you know, where does assembly happen? Where does manufacturing happen? What are legal as well as tax considerations? The last two are probably something you were not expecting, but it is questions that I still get asked. So, you know, what are the benefits of having an offshore holding company to hold the China investment? Is this something that still makes sense? And what about Hong Kong? Um, and particularly with the political instability that's occurring right now, it is something I do want to touch on um, because it is in a lot of people's minds. And then we'll, we'll, we'll sum up um, today's presentation. So let's just get started on what are the 10 key points when choosing a location in China. And, and again, these are my 10 key points. Um, this is all what I perceive as things that companies I've worked with have placed a lot of uh, emphasis on. And obviously some of this is probably more related to what a lot of companies are doing today, which is e-commerce, retail, um, and that form of trade. So bear with me if you aren't in those sectors. Some of these things will still pertain to you. So the first one is style of operation. Now, obviously, with e-commerce developing, with all of these high-tech industries that are coming out, um, there is a much more kicked back, casual, laid back type of atmosphere with a lot of these organizations. And I think especially if you look in some of the tier one cities like Shanghai, like Beijing, you are finding more of these co-working spaces where employees want to be based, especially if you are a small startup organization. Um, a company like myself, being in corporate services, we have to uphold a more conservative image. So I don't think co-working spaces for my industry and sector would be optimal. So you definitely have to take uh, you know, the type of style and image that you want to portray to the public uh, into account when trying to find your location. Um, then you have obviously the demographics. So the first is when you're choosing your location, um, if for example, you're a retailer, you know, 
what type of consumers are walking around your office space uh, or the retail space. Um, if you are looking for suitable employees, is it very far away from where people are residing and living? Um, you've definitely got to look at the demographics. If it's a student town, um, are you going to find more university students than professionals? So definitely look into the demographics of the district as well as the city that you're looking to establish in. Foot traffic, again, something very key. Um, I remember a very long time ago, I had set up a gelateria for an Italian client of mine. Um, they had found a brand new mall in Changshan Park. It's not new anymore, but at that time it was a brand new mall um, in Zhongchang Park in Shanghai. And the biggest dilemma that they had was that the only available retail spaces were on the third floor. Now, if you're a gelateria, you probably would prefer to be on the first floor because you're going to have much more foot traffic. Um, and in those days, malls did not necessarily have food courts. So being on the third floor, they were really out of the foot traffic. And after three months, they closed their operations. So keep in mind foot traffic and how it's going to affect your business. Accessibility and parking. Now, I think this is very key, particularly if you are in the manufacturing sector or you are looking to go into a trade zone. Um, people might not know distances, but just as a comparison, when you're looking at the central business district in Shanghai all the way out to the international airport, you're looking at about an hour's drive. Most of the free trade zones where there are manufacturing facilities, warehousing facilities, um, or other forms of zones, they are at least a 45 minute to one hour drive from the downtown. So you've either got to check that there is MTR stations or if people are driving, do they have car parks and is there accessibility? Definitely look at competition. I think this is a key thing. Um, look at where your competitors have decided to register their companies. Now, what a lot of people are not aware of, and I, I try to emphasize this particularly in the pre-investment stage of going into China, is you've got to do your benchmarking. But not only that, you've got to do a benchmarking from a legal perspective. So if you're not aware, you can obtain the content within a company's business license through the Mofcom's computer system. It doesn't cost anything. It's actually free of charge. All you need is the Chinese name of the company, and hopefully, if you can get the address, then you'll find out all of these details. Um, if you don't have the address, you can still uh, do a search based on the Chinese name. So through that, you can find out the business scope of your competitor, the, the capital investment, you can find out where they're located, you can find out their corporate structure, who, who are the main players within the organization, by players, I mean individuals. And this can help you to understand where people are locating from a city level as well as from a district level. Um, and it might then give you insight into where you might want to be located, either next to them or far away from them. Look at the proximity to other businesses and services. Now, in my previous company, when, I, when we relocated into our traditional office space, um, it was an A-grade building, but the surrounding area was pretty bare. Um, we still did not have a metro system that was close to us. Now there, now there is. Um, so there was an issue for me in terms of accessibility, and there was definitely an issue for me in terms of rest, just restaurant lunch. Where, where were my staff going to have lunch? Where was I going to have lunch? Um, so it is important to look at the proximity to other businesses and services. As I highlighted in yesterday's presentation with Caroline, Starting off in business centers, I think for startup organizations is great because you have immediate access to other businesses. You have immediate access to a social life, meaning people are around you, you gain ideas. Um, uh, this is a great advantage of also co-working spaces and services. So you might be able to find in the business center companies that can offer you services, act as your suppliers. Um, definitely look at the image and history of the site. So I remember with the building where we chose our traditional office, uh, throughout the term of the 10 years that I was allocated and that I was based in that building, the ownership of the building changed three times. And what that meant was that for a period of uh, about 18 months to 24 months after each sale, the new owners wanted to renovate. 
So there was constant renovation going on in the building. And it just it, it was very frustrating. So, you know, look at the history, look at the development, look at the image and see, you know, try to see and ask if there are going to be any future developments within, within the building. Um, look at the regulations. Are you allowed to be based there? That's a big question you should be asking. Are there zoning restrictions? Um, you know, make sure you, you understand what the regulations are associated with that building. Look at the building's infrastructure. Now, if you are going into lovely converted factory buildings that are now co-working spaces, definitely check the heating system in winter. Um, we went into a traditional grade A office building and I still had a heater, a foot heater under my table to keep me warm during the days. So that's just an example. So I mean, I'm, I'm in the CBD, in a grade A building and I still have a heater under my desk. So understand the building's infrastructure because this could affect the um, perception that the employees have uh, in terms of working for you. And look at the utilities and other costs. So when you're looking at rent, don't forget to ask about management fees and don't forget to ask about utility fees if there are any because that might be included into the management fee, it might not. So make sure you are aware when creating your budget, not just to look at the rental fee, look at the management fee, look at the utility costs that are associated. It can have an impact on you. For those of you that missed Monday's session, um, I was talking a lot about the new foreign investment law, but I was also touching on the updates that have occurred within the negative lists and the encouraged um, industry lists because these are probably the first two points you should look at to ascertain where you can set up your business. So the negative list basically lists out industries, fields, and businesses um, which are restricted or prohibited from establishing in China, meaning you either need a joint venture partner, Chinese partner, or you just can't get into the market at all. Um, the negative list has been recently updated in June 2019. And each time there is a change in the negative list, the amount of restricted or prohibited industries is decreasing, meaning that you have more availability to set up. Um, China uses the free trade zones as well as other zones as a testing platform for industries that are getting out of the negative list. So that used to be prohibited and restricted and no longer are. Um, so this will be, if you have been in the, in the negative list and now it's been taken out, you will have no choice but to establish in a free trade zone until there are further changes in the regulations allowing you to be able to operate nationwide. So make sure you look at the negative list, make sure you look at the encouraged industries list because that will you know, give you the idea, do you have to be in the free trade zone or can you be outside of the free trade zone, which obviously then, you know, gives you a greater opportunity to set up anywhere you like. Manufacturing cities within China, again, there may not be a lot of you that are looking to manufacture, but I still think it's important for you to understand where you can be um, established or where, you know, most people are going. Um, there are five major metroplexes um, and obviously for me being based in Shanghai, Shanghai is the one that I know very well um, and it is actually one of the most important hubs for the you know financial trade and shipping. Um, there are obviously other industries that are going into that area. Caroline highlight highlighted a couple yesterday. I'm sure she's going to go into more detail tomorrow but if you're looking if you are in the sectors such as communication equipment, automobile, electronics, steel, petrochemical, biomedical, then th th these are kind of the industries that are going in the Shanghai area. Having said that, you know, most of the e-commerce platforms are based in the surrounding area. Um, so if you look at Shanghai, you know, don't forget Ningbo, Hongzhou, um, uh, Nanjing, Suzhou, all of the areas that are surrounding it as well. Following Shanghai is usually Beijing, which again, it's, it's a city that's largely focused on pharmaceuticals and electronics, um, also on bioengineering and information tech. 
uh, you will find a lot of companies in the aerospace, uh, aviation, alternative energy products, primarily because these types of industries need to have consensus from specific bureaus in Beijing. So hence, they locate there in order to be next to those government authorities. Um, then after Beijing, and, and it's purely because Beijing is now a 30-minute drive, 30-minute uh, train ride from Tianjin, um, Beijing and Tianjin are kind of together in terms of uh, the types of industries and sectors that are there. Guangzhou in southern China, um, similarly Shenzhen, you are looking at toys, electronics. I mean, electronics is probably the biggest one, automobile parts. But because Shenzhen was the first special economic zone to ever be established back in the 1980s, um, you will find every single type of industry located in Guangdong province as a whole everything from people manufacturing toothpicks all the way up to automobile parts, electronic parts, etc. The Go West campaign is something that is quite old. Um, most uh, of the time you don't hear this phrase any longer, but the Go West campaign is kind of what I highlighted in Monday's uh, presentation on the encouraged industries where in regions that are underdeveloped. So if you're looking at the Western region, um, Northwest and South uh, West, you are looking at the Go West campaign where there are special incentives being offered to companies to go out there. Um, and one of the biggest highlights is obviously the tax incentive. So we're gonna start off looking at the legal consequence, oh, excuse me, the legal consequences of selecting your location in China. Um, I have done this where I have put point by point on each individual slide to make it very easy for people to understand what they have to consider. So the first point is when you incorporate a company in China, you must have a registered office address. You do not have a choice around this. It is a vicious circle the first document you have to sign is a lease agreement. Without the lease agreement, you cannot even do the name approval application, which is the first application procedure for incorporating an entity. So you have to sign a lease, um, but you can't have anyone in there yet because you're not registered as a company yet. You can't have employees yet. So it is a very vicious circle where you're going to have to pay upfront rental cost without even having an entity which is why it is very important at this stage to make sure your landlord has the capability of receiving funds from overseas to help pay for the initial costs associated with the rent, which entails the deposit as well as the first couple of months rental fee. So keep that in mind. The lease agreement is not the only document that is needed from your landlord. Your registered office address will also be registered with the Real Estate Bureau, and there will be additional documentation needed for the incorporation stage. Um, if you go into a business center, they will charge additionally to give you that documentation. You've got to make sure that from your landlord, they're not going to charge you additional fees associated, or if they do, include that in your budget. Okay, and make sure again that they can receive those funds from overseas as you won't have an entity locally. The lease agreement plus the uh, additional documentation. So for example, the floor plans, um, the original ownership certificate, uh, all have to be provided. These documents will have to be submitted to the MOFCOM, the Ministry of Commerce, the Administration of Industry and Commerce um, in order to get your company incorporated. Now, the second slide, I'm going to read it out to you. Virtual office addresses are illegal and should be avoided. I am saying this because this is what I have to say. Um, does this mean it does not exist? Of course not. It absolutely exists. But I have to say this. So be careful. Um, when you work with business centers, they do offer very enticing solutions, which I would definitely recommend you to uphold, which is a registered office address only solution. 
meaning they will provide you a space um, that you actually cannot use because it's used, being used by someone else, but you can register your company in that space. Um, you will have then for that period of time a lower fee to pay and um, you will only use it for the registered office address portion. Now, I have had a couple of clients very recently uh, go into situations as follows. One client has been, um, I, I don't want to say pushed, kind of been enticed to establish their structure in Yushi um, based on business partners requirements. Because uh, the location where they are supposed to establish is not yet built, meaning it's under construction, they cannot use it as a registered office address. As such, the Wuxi Promotions Bureau has offered them a virtual office solution. And for the first time in my career, I have actually seen the Wuxi government indicate very transparently on a uh, document stamped by the Wuxi, by, by the landlord, that they are going to be providing a space that no rental fee has to be paid that it is only used for the incorporation of the company um, and they are doing this so that once the uh, construction site is built and real offices are available they can then switch so they have they're under full protection now what is a bit uh, scary for a lot of Westerners is they did have to sign a lease agreement with this landlord there is a rental fee in the lease agreement but because the Chinese government requires a lease agreement they had to sign it. So having this separate piece of paper um, that explains the relationship uh, and it is stamped just validates the fact that they felt more secure going into this relationship. So be weary of the virtual office addresses. I also recently had another client where I did not do the incorporation of the company and I think that they used or their previous provider used a similar service for this type of virtual office address. And the issue is, is the client forgot, they never changed into their operational address. And as a consequence, after two years, the uh, MOFCOM has actually suspended the business license, which in turn has caused their bank to suspend services until, until their business license is updated with the address. So if you use the virtual office concept, it's all fine and good but just protect yourselves, okay? Get the landlords to describe the relationship on a separate piece of paper and make sure you, you, you make it a priority to find a subsequent office that is physically operational and then change because to have your bank account stopping, not good, okay? You can't pay suppliers, you can't receive funds. So you're all, your whole business is basically halted until your status is then um, updated. A one-year lease agreement must be signed. Uh, any agreement that is shorter won't be accepted by the government during the registration procedure. So why am I adding this? I'm adding this because I get a, a lot of clients who, they know that the lease agreement is their first step because without the address, they cannot move forward with the name approval step. The downside is they sign the lease in a very hard, hurried pace then they realize they haven't really thought through their plan of the incorporation. They hold off because they need board meetings and decisions to be made. As a consequence, you're looking six months down the line and now finally they submit their documentation. They're submitting their documentation with a lease that is one year old, but has six months already expired. Even that will be denied by the government. So be prepared. The minute you sign your lease, you should be ready to incorporate, to submit that document and incorporate, okay? Um, please do keep that in mind. Otherwise, you're, you've got to go through the whole process once again of re-signing a lease agreement. And that might require then more payments that are needed to um, that landlord. Uh, the next point that I want to make, and I know it sounds really common sense, but a lot of people for some reason, it doesn't uh, relate to them. Um, in China, the business scope is a very key component to when you're registering your company. The business scope is 
uh, the activities and functions that you are permitted to do within this entity and within this structure. It is important that whatever is written in your business scope matches the type of property that you're renting, okay? So if you are starting off as a, as a trading entity, and you're doing import, export, or you're doing, uh, you're purchasing and selling domestically, this is just a general trading company. You can be located in a commercial office space, you can be located also in a warehousing space because you might have inventory. However, if you now wanna say, well, in-house we would like to do some assembly and we will have an added value on the products, which means that the HS code of the product will change, then you gotta switch to a manufacturing space. Now, some warehousing facilities can be considered as uh, production sites, some cannot. And if you're in a commercial space, then you've got to switch to a factory space, okay? One of the documents, as I mentioned before, that needs to be submitted is the ownership certificate of the owner of the property. And within that ownership, blah, 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 excuse me, and within that ownership certificate, it does state the type of property it is. Likewise, if you are in trading and now you say that you would like to go into retail, you need to get a lease agreement of a retail space, okay? So the types of properties are very simple. You're gonna have commercial spaces with a variety of different grades of buildings. You're going to have retail spaces and you're gonna have warehousing facilities and you're also gonna have factory sites. Um, so industrial, industrial types of properties. Um, so be aware of how your property is designated and make sure that it relates to your business scope, okay? Um, I think the most important aspect with anything is just remembering that in China, only one company can be registered in one registered office space. So as Caroline highlighted in yesterday's presentation, one of the challenges is that you should make sure that within your due diligence, um, of the property that the previous tenants have been removed um, from the, the real estate bureau's registrar, meaning that you can immediately be registered with the real estate bureau registrar. Um, because if not, that will take time as everything in China is bureaucratic and requires time um, to get your name then in the registrar, which means you can't use any of the documentation to do the registration. More importantly, I have a lot of companies approach me saying, I'm not gonna lease anything. I am actually going to place my people in either my customer's workspace or my supplier's workspace. That's wonderful. Um, I think that's great. As long as your supplier or customer is one, allowed by the landlord to sublease and two, there is a separated room where you can register your company there, okay? Makes things complicated. So although you might want your people based there, keep in mind that you have to follow those two requirements. Is your supplier customer allowed to rent to you? Make sure you have a lease agreement. When you register your company, as far as I'm aware, you cannot say that the rent is zero. There has to be a price indicated. If your supplier or customer is giving you the rent free of charge, keep a separate side document explaining the full relationship and payment terms and just protect yourself, right? Make sure you have the ability to register your company. All right, uh, keep all of this in mind. Now, the biggest thing that happens um, in relation to the, to, to the legal side of the thing of things is when a company suddenly realizes that a city that they've chosen is not the right city for their business and they want to change it. So let me give you an example for this. Let's say a company has registered their, has registered their entity in Shanghai. They're realizing this is just not the place for them. Actually, they should have set up in Beijing. Now, this is a big dilemma because you cannot just change your registered office address from one city to another. When you incorporate in Shanghai, you incorporate under the Shanghai municipality, which means your business license is issued by them. 
You cannot just take that business license and bring it up to Beijing. It does not work. So you have a couple of options. The tedious option is you liquidate your Shanghai company and you set up a brand new entity in Beijing, or you set up a branch office in Beijing that is operational, which is probably the easier solution. So this does make things extremely complicated because the minute you set up a branch office, you now have two entities that you have to run and maintain and keep in compliance. So it just adds up cost. So as a consequence, choose your city wisely. It is really not a joke. Take your time to do a location study, travel to China to visit the various sites that you're trying to filter down to and do your research that they really fit not just your short-term goals and objectives for your company, but also your long-term goals and objectives. Um, a lot of you that are online are small, medium-sized companies, so cost is an issue for you, and you want to maintain very clean and transparent budgets. So make sure you do think about this wisely. Let's move on to the tax consequences of selecting your location in China. So. Um, Caroline highlighted this um, yesterday, but I just want to re-highlight it because it, it is a very important component to the tax side of things. If you have decided on a city, so I'm going to use Shanghai as an example. You have decided to locate your business in Shanghai. You have decided to locate your business on, I'm going to use my office address, 300 Huahai Lu, Huahai Road which means that you fall under the Huangpu district. It means you need to then, once your company is incorporated and your business license is issued, you take that business license and you register yourself with your district tax bureau. Every city, so every city has districts and every district has a tax bureau, okay? In Shanghai, you've got the Jing'an tax bureau, You've got the Huangpu Tax Bureau, the Kurong Tax Bureau, you have the Jading Tax Bureau. Every district has its own tax bureau, and that is where you're going to be registering. Okay? Now, there are some good tax bureaus and there are some bad tax bureaus, as you can potentially imagine. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but each tax bureau has their own set of KPIs that they need to achieve. So if you do decide to ever exit that district, that tax bureau is not going to be so happy because they're going to be losing tax funds from you because it's then going to be allocated to a new district. As a result, do you think they're going to make your life easy to leave the district? As you can imagine, they're not. So this is where there are real tax consequences associated. And this is where I'm going to explain to you what will happen. But before I do, keep in mind tax incentives that may be offered by the state or the local government. Um, so for example, uh, um, even if you decide, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose maybe the free trade, Shanghai free trade zone instead. If you are in a manufacturing or in trading sector and you are in um, high tech, environmental, R&D, you are going to be offered potentially tax incentives. However, as I just said, all tax bureaus have KPIs that they need to achieve. When you do the applications to obtain the tax incentives, they are going to make your life hell. The document list and the criteria that you have to abide by in order to be able to uh, obtain approval for these tax incentives is tough because it means you're going to lower their KPIs in terms of tax revenues. So when tax incentives are being offered, be very clear with whomever you're speaking to what they are. Make sure they are listed carefully down. Make sure you know what the criteria is for approval. Can you match that criteria? If not, don't budget these tax incentives. It can completely destroy the budget you're creating for your China business. 
if you do think you can achieve the approval. It is an approval process. So be aware that you have a 50-50 chance of winning it. <laughs> because even if the criteria match and you can achieve it, they will find everything in their power that you don't obtain it. So keep that in mind also. There will be a 50-50 chance of you being able to obtain that incentive. They, they do make it very difficult. I just wanted to give you an example. Um, if, you are a, if you are considered a high new tech enterprise, um, then basically you get a 15% corporate income tax rate versus a 25% one. But you have criteria that you need to abide by. And here are the three criteria that I've outlined in terms of the core IP, um, the amount of employees that need to have very high diplomas, as well as the research and development expense component. Um, copies of these slides will be provided so you can definitely read this up um, at a later stage, but I did want to provide you with an example. Um, companies that are considered as high new tech enterprises would be companies like this. So e-commerce, if you are an e-commerce uh, uh, company, um, then this would be the type of um, incentive that you could potentially apply for as long as you do follow the criteria. So again, uh, I'll leave, you know, you'll all obtain a copy of, of, of the slides um, and, and you'll be able to read this further. So the biggest issue with, with tax consequences. So let's say you have located in Shanghai, you have decided to find, you've decided to rent an office space in Huangpu district, and now you want to move to Jing'an because after five years, the office space, uh, you've reached capacity in the office space, you are going to be increasing further headcount, and the only location you found that is suitable for your future development is in Jing'an. Now, my first advice to you would be stay as, po as much as possible within Huangpu. So when you do your location search, the first thing is search in Huangpu district because you don't want to have to change districts. Okay, you don't want to have to change your tax bureau. There's just, there is more to, the, to just the changing districts aspect. Don't forget, you've developed a relationship with your tax officer over a period of five years. I can't even tell you the value that's placed in that. And to now switch to a new tax bureau, to a new tax officer, you're starting the relationship from scratch again. So keep that also in mind. So when you are looking to expand your operation, try and find something in the district you're already in so there's no district change. Um, and if you can't find that, then the only solution is obviously to move outside of the, that district into the new district. So what are the consequences? And please don't get overwhelmed by what I'm about to say. It is very bureaucratic. What will happen is, the Huangpu Tax Bureau will tell you that you have to do a tax audit and a tax closure. This can take up to three months, if not longer. In that period of time, you do the audit, you do the tax closure. It also means you will not be able to purchase any further fa piaos from that tax bureau. The uh, dilemma is that when you move, for example, to the Jing'an Tax Bureau, you have to again do a tax registration with the tax officer. You have to start from scratch the relationship and you have to make sure you have the ability to purchase FAPIAOs to not halt your business. Okay, because if you are invoicing locally, that's the worst thing that can possibly happen. So, um, this is very sensitive because you might have the Jing'an Tax Bureau say, Not a problem, I'm happy because now you're going to come into my district, I'm going to earn new revenue from you, um, and I want to issue, but they have to follow policy. And generally speaking, they need the confirmation that everything is closed down to the first tax bureau before they can issue any FAP house to you. Now, there are negotiations that can occur, you can discuss, but this is something that may halt your business meaning you will not be able to issue FAPIAOs to customers for a certain period of time. Worst case, or minimum time frame, three months. Worst case, longer. So if you do move offices, you've got to plan this very carefully, right? 
understand when is your peak season for invoicing. Understand, you know, have preliminary meetings with the tax officers to explain the situation and how best to solve it that you don't halt your business. Um, dealing with the tax bureaus is dealing like with your partner or spouse. Uh, communication is key. Communicate. Don't be afraid to share things with your tax officers. Okay, talk to them. Explain what the situation is and say that the worst thing that could happen right now is a halt of the business because I need to do X, Y, and Z. What solutions can you offer me? How can we do this? How can we manage this? Okay, so definitely have that dialogue with your tax bureaus and keep this length of time in mind. So that's the end of looking at the legal and tax consequences. And one thing that I do get asked a lot is, do I need to consider an offshore holding company? Now, again, this is a key component about where do you wanna locate your company? Um, before you can actually incorporate in China and you do wanna have a holding company, that has to be established first, okay? The issue is, is that the tax bureaus have become much more knowledgeable and have received quite a lot of education on offshore holding companies and the fact that they can be utilized as tax havens to evade taxes. Since the global economic situation is such that the word tax evasion is just not welcome, you've really got to understand now whether having an offshore holding company for your business makes sense or not. And if it does make sense, you definitely have to think about placing commercial as well as economic substance into that structure and into that entity. Um, so it's not just an offshore structure or just a holding structure, it is actually a type of operational structure that has commercial and economic substance. Why do I say that? Primarily because there are double taxation agreements that exist between jurisdictions. And if the Chinese tax bureau sees that your entity or your shareholding entity is, or the, the entity that you, sister entity that you wanna transact with is purely holding, purely offshore, you will not be able to get the preferential tax rates that are stated in the double taxation agreements, meaning that the tax rates applicable will be much higher. So thinking about an offshore holding company structure is very important to do. It might completely make sense for your business. Um, I say it makes sense uh, for companies, because I see this a lot more now, where companies are looking for investors they're looking for that additional funding and they're finding investors anywhere in the world. And it could very well be that you want these investors to only be involved in either the Asian business or just even the China business. And it might make more sense to have these investors placed in a type of holding company versus in the actual physical operation that is occurring in China. Why do I say that? Because having joint venture structures in China are definitely more complicated to manage, um, to exit shareholders, to have new entrants of shareholders. It's a, it's a bureaucratic procedure. And in certain jurisdictions like Hong Kong, Singapore, and other places, it's much easier to add people, take people out, et cetera. So definitely think about whether these types of structures make sense for you or not. Now, the biggest question I get asked currently is, does Hong Kong make sense? Because historically, Hong Kong was always used as, you know, the phrase back in the day was, Hong Kong was the gateway to China. Oh, sorry, Hong Kong is the gateway to China. It is the starting point for companies that are looking to go into that market. Now, I've added this in because just recently I've had two clients, two companies, wanting to have a Hong Kong holding structure for the main reason of obtaining investors. And they decided against it because of the current political instability. But more importantly, and you know, I, I wanna touch on the political instability, but I think more importantly, 
it's the issue with opening the bank accounts in Hong Kong. It's not as straightforward as, as it used to be. The banks are required to go ve through very strict um, compliance procedures. Um, we call them know your client uh, compliance procedures, KYC processes. And um, it makes it very difficult and very lengthy to open up bank accounts for Hong Kong companies. So this was the main reason, because of length of time, they didn't have that time to spend. They, they needed to go into the Chinese market and they decided finally to do it direct for the main reason of time. Um, otherwise, Hong Kong would have been a very good option. And obviously I did get asked the question, you know, what is my thought on the current instability that's occurring there? Um, the current instability is not fun. Um, I have my family that's based there. My parents are, are retired in Hong Kong um, and, and we have our own operations that are existing there. I think on a day-to-day -day basis, business is as usual. This past week, it hasn't really been business as usual because schools have been closed uh, for safety reasons. Um, and that's mainly because of the transportation aspects um, throughout the city. Um, but in theory and in general, and what every government organization, whether it's Invest Hong Kong, the Hong Kong ETO offices, they are all saying that business is usual. Um, business is as usual. And I can say that also for the clients that we're managing and administering in Hong Kong, business is as usual. Um, some people are having a couple of hiccups with the customs and the ports in Hong Kong. Um, but other than that, it, it, it really is moving smoothly. The dilemma that is incurring for most entrants into Hong Kong is the bank account versus anything else. So I did want to add my two cents in there because it is something that has historically always been important is that people have been thinking, you know, do we use holding companies or not? Do we use Hong Kong? Should we use another jurisdiction like Singapore? Or, you know, if you're from the UK, you can also use a UK holding structure. Um, uh, so, you know, you, you definitely can. Um, it's just something I would advise is think about the economic and commercial substance aspect Think about the structure, think how you're going to use it. Um, and everyone is looking for investors. So I know that is an optimal type of structure to create when you're when you're going into China. So let's um, do the final conclusion. Um, and you know, I think I'm going to start off with the first one, which is probably every real estate agent's mantra. So it's a pity Caroline isn't online today, but location 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 that is a key aspect to any business um, you know the location of a business can affect how it operates it can affect sales it can affect talent acquisition it can affect talent retainment um, it can be costly to constantly change and move around it can affect your budget um, so ultimately, when you are choosing a location in China, have a strategy, okay? Meaning, if you decide to take the route of working with a business center, using their registered office address only solutions, great. But then what's your strategy after that? What are you going to do once the company is incor incorporated? Where are you going to house that first staff member? So definitely have a strategy, have a plan in terms of what you're going to do. You have many options available to you um, in terms of how you want to do it. Um, Caroline didn't really want me to mention this yesterday, but I kind of want to emphasize it in today's presentation. Why should you use a real estate agent um, versus going direct to a promotions bureau in a zone or going direct to a landlord? I think the issue is that you being new to the market won't know how to negotiate rental prices. There is a technique to it. And if you work with a real estate agency that, first of all, has a relationship with the landlord, because as Caroline pointed out, she gets paid from the landlords. She has an ethical code to make sure that she achieves the client's requests. She gets paid from the landlord. So all the real estate agents have excellent relationships with business centers and individual landlords and owners. So keep that in mind. Don't, don't, you know, everything in China is about guanxi. It's about relationship. They have those relationships and they've been developing them for decades. 
um, they know how low they can go in terms of rental fees. So they're going to be your negotiation arm and they know how to negotiate. And if they're good agents, they will tell you where they won't be able to go further in terms of the negotiation. Um, so definitely meet with a variety of real estate agents, right? Depending on where you actually want to locate um, and see how they can offer you. And please do get advice about the location. I have seen clients who are now suffering um, because their original provider, and it, you know, it could be a lawyer, it could be anyone, didn't place enough emphasis on location. Um, I can't emphasize it more because I've just seen clients spend too much money on fixing this issue um, as they've been established and have been operating. So I'm going to leave today's presentation um, there. And um, uh, there are a couple of questions that have come in, but I think they are quite case specific. So Neil, I've seen your question. I'm gonna answer you directly. This is very, very specific to your case. If any of you do have any other questions regarding this, um, please add them into the question section now. I'd be happy to get back to you. Otherwise, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, there's only been a question from Neil, so nobody else has put anything in yet. Um, so again, like I said, if you do have questions, you can add them in right now. I'd be happy to answer you. Um, Neil, I'll send you an email um, to answer your question. And um, I'd be happy to help and advise you on, on that type of um, strategy. Um, if you really enjoyed our webinar series and you'd like to know more, we have webinar series that are planned all the way through till February, so December, January, and February. Um, and we've got a ex very exciting one actually in March that's coming up um, as well. That's not on the website yet as we're still in the planning phase, um, but do join. Um, they're complimentary and they always, you know, information is power in China. That's all I'm going to say. So if you also want to receive our weekly newsletter, feel free to subscribe on our, on our website. And just remember, tomorrow, um, Caroline's going to be going in and doing a deep dive specifically into the Shanghai market. She's also based in Shanghai. So, you know, it's one of these things where um, hopefully you'll get an overview of what happens actually in just one city um, and what to keep in mind specifically in one city as well. So um, if you haven't subscribed to that or registered for that webinar, please do. You can do so on our events page. Um, and, uh, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I hope to see you again tomorrow. Have a great afternoon, great evening. Goodbye.